everyone, guess who we've got back again? Saint Murad. I've had to twist his arm to come on and do another video with us. <laughs> Welcome back, Murad. How are you? Thank you. As you know, I am uh, in the dark these days, just with the yeah. uh, Quranic translation and the other uh, uh, secret project that <laughs> I'm working on. So Excellent. we said maybe we can make this uh, quick video tonight. Um, how's it going with the translation? Any uh, update on, on that? Yeah, well, currently I am at the stage of, um, you know, like trying to finish the concordance and perfect it. And maybe in the future I will make just a short video asking people about uh, their opinions about English words. Like, for example, what's the difference between clear and lucid? I want to see their opinions as English speakers, as native English speakers, how they use this, uh, these words and the uh, subtle differences, because a dictionary, no matter how good it is, it will never give you the full uh, profile of a word, how people hear it and feel it and stuff. So they yeah. can just give me more insight. And this is the stage I am currently at trying to finish the concordance and after that i will start start the actual translation yeah i'm actually on that score uh there's someone that you will be familiar with they're on both our channels hegel hegel Do you remember him yes he he speaks maltese that's right I, he's got experience of working on dictionaries and concordances because i spoke to him there a few weeks ago about that very thing um, so I think it might be a good idea to have a chat with him because he might have uh, some advice to, to help you. He's got a very interesting way of approaching it. Um, just an idea there. Yeah, not a if problem. You... But uh, as you see, uh, I'm kind of like I, I will ask all the experts in the other translation, which will have the Aramaic. But with this oh, one, yeah. we will just keep it this way because it already has mistakes which comes from halves from the reading. Yeah, yeah. So this will retain the mistakes. I will not change it. Yeah, you see? yeah. <laughs> well, I, I just meant in terms of maybe just on the tactical side of, of creating dictionaries and lectionaries, but not in, in terms of the content of it as such. But uh, that's great. It's, it's good to see you're, you're working away and it's, it's, it's reaching fruition. Um, so in relation to what I've been up to, I've been on a cycle trip across Europe. I'm, I'm following a track that follows the the, um, the path of the Ottomans, really. I started in Istanbul, tried to cycle out of Turkey and uh, didn't have much success. success. Met, uh, met a lot of cul-de-sacs and uh, decided in the end to take a train to uh, Bulgaria. And I've been cycling from Bulgaria ever since, really. Um, so I've took a bit of a break today. Um, I thought it would be a good idea to touch base with you. Um, I've got something really exciting to share. Um, it's it's one of those um, things that makes me think that the standard Islamic narrative has gone through a few editions. And it's in relation to the story of Muhammad's burial place. And it's, a, it's an issue that has come up in different ways um, over different videos, you know, I, I once suggested the Dome of the Rock may have been the burial place. It certainly has a connotation of a burial place for someone. Um, but in the Islamic tradition, where is Muhammad meant to be buried, according to the Islamic tradition, uh, Murad? I think it's in Medina. Yeah. Right, in the well, uh, green uh, the green dome mosque. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, do you know, in terms of the current mosque that's there, do you know who renovated it or who um, or when it was redone, let's say? Um, no, but uh, I think there is an archaeological find uh, about that, yeah, right, well, in, uh, in I, Saudi Arabia. What I've heard is that uh, Suleiman I, in the 15th century, if I'm not mistaken, uh, went renovating it. Um, what was there is 
is up to you know questioning but um it seems that really the what we have today comes from the the 15th century so basically it's an ottoman construction um but what's more interesting is that there was a tradition up to that point that Muhammad, whether he was a real person or not, was buried in Mecca. Now, this isn't entirely new. Um, I mentioned uh, a Chinese source, um, which incidentally, it's in the same sort of time frame. I've written it down here, uh, 1433 AD. So around the, the time the Suleiman uh, would have started reconstructing um, a mosque in uh, Medina. It's uh, the Chinese source is called Ying Ye Xing Lan, which in English is the overall survey surveys shores. Okay, uh, that's the English translation of it. Um, and simply the line that that's of relevance is it says behind the grave of Maha Ma Muhammad is a well, a spring of pure and sweet water named Abi San San, which San San is obviously the Zam Zam. Um, now, that's one indicator of a tradition that Muhammad was buried in Mecca. But there's also this map. I'm going to put this map up here for all of you. Um, now, you can see it's a, it's a fantastic map. Um, it was done by a person called Ortelius. Um, and it was first published in 1570 AD, and it was done on the basis of um, a survey that was done in the 16th century. And you can see from the coast of Africa that this was a very accurate survey. In fact, if you look at the, the coastal region of Africa in the map, you can see it's very accurate and you you could easily be mistaken to think that it was based on a satellite image. Now, the central part of Africa isn't done so well because obviously they are serving the coast. Um, um, and you can see also that in the eastern part of uh, the Red Sea, um, you have Arabia and various places connected with Arabia. But what's interesting is there's a reference in Latin to Mecca. Mecca and I'm doing this from memory, folks, because I'm working off a phone here. But in Latin, it says um, Mecca, Hik, Muhammad, um, Sepulchre, uh, visi Visitor, which means um, this is where Muhammad's sepulchre is visited. So this is in the 16th century. Now, why is in the 16th century, a reference to Muhammad being buried there, if the tradition that we have through um, uh, Ibn, um, Ibn Hishim. It, it is, Ibn Hishim, it's been a while since I've referred to him. Well, according to him, um, Muhammad is buried in Medina. Um, so this created a problem because um, his works were essentially not read by many until it seems the Ottomans start getting interested in all of this and they start reading and a few of the more intelligent ones would have cotton, cottoned on to a contradiction, which was that the local tradition in Mecca was that Muhammad was buried there, whereas their Sarah was saying the opposite, that he was buried in Medina. And it's around this time that Suleiman started to build the mosque for the the tomb of Muhammad, so it seems, in in this in this period, um, and so the Ottomans are very good at deleting awkward bits of archaeology. Um, we know that in the 19th and 20th centuries, the Wahhabis destroyed a huge amount of the tombs that existed in uh, Medina. And they even closed down access to the tomb of Muhammad in the 1990s. Um, so what do you make of that? Make of that? 
Well, uh, I think a lot of things were destroyed in the, uh, as you said, the First World War. And uh, the Brits, the uh, the intelligence they had, uh, a lot to do with it. There is a lot of secrets in these, uh, in this part of the world, the Ottomans and the Brits, and how they actually created modern day Saudi Arabia. It was not there, so uh, it's very possible, because Al Bukhari was finalized at these days, and Saudi Arabia came to be at these days, and. Uh, so the the standard Islamic narrative it's much newer even than we uh, much more recent than we think. Yeah, um, and actually, in relation to this, I saw kind of other examples of this sort of buttressing of the standard Islamic narrative on a visit to the Topkapi um, Palace there a few weeks ago, and I saw some examples of the holy relics of Muhammad and the included. A wooden stick, which was claimed to be Muhammad or uh, Moses's staff. That I was know this. Bowl. One. I know this one. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. and various bits of hair that was meant to be Muhammad's hair and beard and so forth. So the Ottomans were very good at creating evidence if there was no evidence and destroying evidence if it was contradictory. But um, remember, so... a lot of these relics they were uh, forgeries and they were gifts. Like if you're going to meet the Sultan and you want to make a good deal, then you will yeah. get him uh, a staff and you will tell him this is the staff of Moses. <laughs> so this nice. is how it used yeah. to work. Yeah, It's not for to create historicity, it's to make gifts to the Sultans okay. and the Emirs. And also yeah. when they used to deal with the Christian world, they could give them stuff like this and uh, the other way around. So this yeah. was the main reason. It's like souvenirs, so it was... like you have a souvenir in your home. Okay, so it wasn't as conscious um, of, of an act of fraudery um, on behalf of the Ottomans. It's more a case of people giving gifts and uh, making big claims about them. Yes, because they were too powerful for that, and they didn't think ahead as you'd expect. Yeah, You know, it's much more simple than that. Yeah. So I'm going to stop it there, um, Murad. Um, it's uh, great catching up with you. Keep on with the, the hard slog, the hard work. And I'm sure everyone will be really looking forward to seeing your translation coming out very soon. Yeah, this was just a quick update, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And we will be back with uh, surprises. Mel has a lot of surprises for you. Surprise guests with uh, bombshells that will uh, be only on this Islamic Origins channel, so you have to subscribe and subscribe to me also at St. Murad because I will be going in a much different path in the future, stuff that you haven't seen before. And thank you very much, and we will talk again soon. That's great, Murad. I'll see you very soon. Bye-bye.